Uh, Paula this meeting Petronio. is being recorded. Okay, it's being recorded. <laughs> the meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Um, Paula is the head of the biomedical data science team at IS Global, and she specializes in machine learning for chronic and infectious disease screening and digital health applications. Paula holds a PhD in biophysics from the Stanford University and uh, an undergraduate degree in physics from the Instituto of Alceiro in Argentina. After her PhD, she went on to continue her research career in the private sector with the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research, and then later as a senior data scientist at Roche, where she developed several machine learning models applied to drug discovery. Her postdoctoral work in neuroscience continued then forward in the Barcelona Brain Research Center, and combines, uh, it combined imaging uh, and machine learning to predict early Alzheimer's disease before the appearance uh, of uh, cognitive decline. Uh, she is moreover, <laughs> moreover, on top of everything that she does, a digital health startup consultant, mentor and activist promoting ethics and diversity in the STEM fields. And she organizes every year the Women in Data Science Barcelona Biomedicine event. And we heard that today, this year there will be yet another edition. Um, her main research lines in her group at IS Global are the application of biomedical data science and AI to early diagnosis, risk assessment and management of chronic conditions, mental health and neurodegeneration, health informatics, real world evidence from patients and wearables and medical imaging. And we look forward to a very interesting presentation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. I feel so privileged to be here. We dreamt about the. I was invited like four months ago, and I was like, okay, it's a long time, and now it's here, and there's this beautiful audience. So um, thank you for having me. I'm just going to start the presentation. Let me, okay, got it. Okay. Let's see if it's switch. Let me give me a second. Okay. So my talk today is about how can machine learning improve clinical practice? There are a lot of AI papers. How can we take them to the clinic? That's a huge challenge. I'm going to talk about the AI, and we can discuss the challenges later. So um, how can machine learning help doctors? I envision three main pillars. One is to detect diseases earlier, before the appearance of symptoms. That's early detection using imaging, using risk scores, and so on. The other pillar after we detect the disease is about curing the disease, discovering new drugs, identifying new targets and biomarkers, and changing the life habits. Sometimes we have these chronic conditions, we can only act on our own body. And the later pillar where AI can make a difference is monitoring. Monitoring these diseases using digital devices. That's the development of notifications and risk assessment tools. So we have a wearable that says, Houston, I have a problem. And then we have to start the diet or start running or quit smoking. We shouldn't smoke anyways. Mm -hmm. And this is about the development of digital health platforms. And there are so many, and not all of them are successful. Why? So um, I just want to describe a little bit about the work that we do in our group. We have two main areas. One is health informatics and epidemiology. We combine data science and epidemiology, and we analyze data from few main sources. One is, again, wearables and telemedicine. Another source is the courts and clinical trials. And the last one, and I would say the most challenging one, is about real world evidence from the hospital. <clears throat> we go to the hospital, we leverage to get data, anonymized data from patients, and we analyze it. But this is the secondary use of medical data. Doctors have to enter it. So much information, they don't have time. And this data is full of noise and errors and blanks. The other part of the group, I would say 70% of the group, is dedicated to biomedical imaging and deep learning. And we will talk about that today. We like to look at opportunities where the diagnosis is very hard. And this is the case, for example, of ultrasound. Doctors perform an ultrasound and they cannot clearly distinguish the disease. And then they have to have a biopsy. So we want to extract more content from these ultrasounds. But then we also work with a microscopy, for example, and I will explain an application. And we leverage tools 
that we use for other disciplines, like analyzing <coughs> satellite data. It's amazing how analyzing satellite data or looking at formatting from cells, we use the similar tools, spatial statistics and machine learning. And I will explain a little bit about that as well. So just um, some faces, the work I will present to today is thanks to them. And I feel very grateful. So I want to show them first because they are the protagonists of the stories and the little pro and the projects I will share with you today. We're about 10, 11 people in the group. We have students, we have PhDs and postdocs. And we are also collaborating with different hospitals and different institutions and also with companies like Kriba, for example. It's very interesting that working academics together with the private sector and the hospital is how I believe we'll take these tools to the clinic. Because if we keep only writing papers, we'll never get to the patient. And that I think is, should be, at least in our group, our vision and our priority. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to start sharing um, a bit of examples and methodology in the field of health informatics and machine learning. This is about calculating risk for patients. And I'm gonna show you an image here. Barcelona. Which year was this image taken? 2020, during COVID. So what happened in 2020 was unforgettable. We were afraid, afraid of what, of the unknown, afraid of dying, afraid of a lot of change that was gonna happen in our lives. And a lot of us suffered, mostly all of us suffered in some way. So the first project that I wanna sh share with you is retrospectively thinking about those times during lockdown, how we felt the loneliness, the impotence, and how we can analyze the data that came from that time in order to be prepared so that this doesn't happen again, or at least it's not that bad, because there will be more epidemics coming. We don't wanna suffer that much. How can we use technology to mitigate that? So main issues that happened, and we measure them after COVID, was a 25 increase in the prevalence of anxiety and depression. Young people and women were the main targets. Everyone was affected. But women and, 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 and young people are recorded as the, as the main targets at risk of suicide. There was exhaustion, there was loneliness, and there was a lot of increase in domestic violence. In developed countries, about 30 to 50% of people receive no help. It's interesting that about 30, 40% of people at those times decided to change or quit their jobs. Change. So um, to be prepared for next time means for me three things. Who is at risk? identifying the people that are at risk. The second one is understanding the drivers of that risk. And the third will be using technology to plan an intervention, an intervention that is sustainable, economically and societally, socially uh, um, sustainable. How can we do that with technology? So we want to study that using courts and epidemiology. So we, had, we were very gifted to have data from GCAT and uh, IGTP, the hospital, about 9,500 individuals and over 200 variables. We got data from how they lived, the gender, date of birth, alcohol consumption. What happened during those times? Did they change their buying habits? Now they, they use Amazon instead of going to the supermarket. Did they change the exercise that they did? How is the environment? We use a lot of GIS data about pollution, about green spaces, about access. We put all of that in the machine learning algorithm. How many of you guys use machine learning so that I know more or less what's the technical users? I mean, coders? Coders? Good. A few people because this will be a bit broad. How about how many of you work with somebody or work with AI? Work with AI? Okay. Great. So I'll be, try to give a bit of flavor for everybody. So in machine learning pipeline, we put all the variables that we have first in the model. We do a lot of imputation and data processing. 
I have to say that point number one, feature selection is the most difficult part of the project. If you're having working with an AI project and it's been three, four months of data processing, that's fine. That's normal. Don't despair. The predictive model modeling parameter tuning where you choose the model and you start seeing results, that's the easy part. 20% of the project is analyzing the results. It's the most fun. And then at the last part of the pipeline, we have the model evaluation when we really have to validate that model in the 30% of the code that we left out and see if the model is accurate. Okay, so we were very, very good, I would say, a bit proud, but uh, to predict depression and anxiety and self perceived stress at 80% of accuracy. So we analyzed this court. And we use all these variables to predict whether people were at risk of severe depression, mild depression, or they would stay healthy. So we did the same for depression, for anxiety, and for self-perceived stress. And we see here in the figure that we were very good at predicting severe depression or healthy. Not so good at 60% to provide a mild depression. When I see results like this, I say it's fine. Because mild depression, even the gold standard might be, might be confused, right? We have a clinical gold standard of when somebody's mildly depressed. This is very difficult to, to measure. So it's very important when we develop machine learning models that we look at our gold standard, which is the gold standard, and we say, OK, there is a lot of error. When there is a lot of error, then it's OK we don't get very good results. Because our gold standard that we use to train our models is not that great anyway. But it's great to show severe and healthy. So when we look at data like this in our models, in our projects, in medical applications, we look at the confusion matrix, what we predicted versus the true label. And these here, mild and severe label at 71, these are the people that we predicted that they, they, will, be sick, uh, they will be sick and they are sick. That's great, 71%. But this 29% is what in medicine is very important. These are the people that we predicted to be healthy and they are sick and we send them home. So in any clinical applications that you work in the life sciences, the accuracy, the area under the curve is important. But for me, the most important is the recall. Is how many people are sick and we tell them that they are fine. So when we look at machine learning papers, this is quite important. What is the question that we want to address? And what are the metrics that we are looking at? In medical applications, the recall is very important. And the precision sometimes is very important as well. For screening tools like this one, the recall is what we look at. Now, machine learning, people think it's a black box. Is it a black box? If we predict somebody to be depressed or not depressed, yeah, but how do you know? How does the model know? How can the model predict? Is that real? So today in machine learning, we can say it's not a black box anymore. There are a lot of tools that have been developed in the last two, three years that are called AI explainability. These are algorithms that sit on top of our machine learning models. And the goal is to explain these models. This is very important when we talk about trustworthy AI. Probably you hear that, interpretable AI. What does that mean? It means that we are going to use a second layer of algorithms to explain that first, those first predictive models. OK? So some names that you may want to take note, those that are coding, SHAP, LIME, saliency maps, class activation maps, those are a suite of algorithms called explainability or explainable AI or XI. I'm going to show you how SHAP works. So SHAP is going to give us a metric of feature importance with sign. And this is quite technical. So those that are not technically involved, it's OK. Just bear with me. This SHAP algorithm lists the variables by importance. And they take into account the sign. If the variables are, are positive, it's blue, and if the variables are negative, are gray. And the sharp value to the right shows whether they are protective 
to the left and where, whether they are associated with risk to the right. But bear with me, I will explain. A sharp analysis of our model showed that the Duke Index, this is the ability of people to perform daily activities, is associated with depression. That means that people that couldn't climb the stairs or work easily, they suffer the most. Then it showed that health status of people was very important in this model. So people that had already other comorbidities are at risk. People that changed physical activities that got to work out less are at risk. People that had, this is very interesting, people that changed buying habits were at risk of depression. How much are we affected by our capitalist society we want to buy if we kind of buy in the same way? We feel that we don't have enough, like food or access to clothing, and then we get depressed. Females are at risk. This is very interesting. But I look at this graph and I go like, okay, sleeping changes, um, confinement rules, people that struggle with rules were at risk of depression. Of course, like now their life is limited. <coughs> so sharp analysis is very important because we get to understand our model at the global <laughs> level, but also it highlights this risk protective and uh, risk and protective factors that identifies its biases in the data. So I look at this chart and something very important is missing. Gender is there. <coughs> How about the age? What is the age? Like if we think about inclusivity, we were discussing today with Eva. How about old people and young people suffering in COVID? Why is it not reflected here? This is a bias because most of the people in this cohort are older people. So age doesn't become an important factor, right? But it is an important factor. So this sharp explainability is really important for every machine learning model in medical, especially. So for now, for example, I don't, every time I have to review a paper in medical AI, if there is no explainability, that's a minus. We need to explain our models especially if a doctor is going to use these models, we need to explain how they work. So this is about the global explainability, how the model works. But how the model works for each person that has been diagnosed, it's called local explainability. And I'm going to give you an example of local explainability here. You can derive the sharp values for each person. So here I'm giving two cases of people in the court. Fake faces, of course, but this is just uh, created synthetically. So participant 284 ha had specific risk, as risk factors and protective factors. For example, he had poor social support, health status was bad, and he had a lot of symptoms. So he <laughs> was at very high depression risk. Also, for example, this other participant 532, she had chronic illness. And she had also poor health status. So we can use SHAP for global interpretability and for also local interpretability. Why is the model diagnosing severe depression for this particular sample? So it's very important that we, analyze, using machine learning, look at the global explainability and the local explainability. What did Guillermo? Uh, the PhD student working this project do next. He clustered people with similar risk profile. And if we're thinking of planning a sustainable inter intervention, we really want to see which people in the population had a similar risk profile. And now we can cluster people by their sharp values. It's very important. This is very interesting because each cluster has specific features. So, for example, ah, sorry. For example, uh, each of these persons was associated to a, a different cluster, and then we can go and look what each cluster means. So, for example, cluster one is a cluster that groups together people with bad health status and chronic depression. This other cluster five looks at people with only uh, bad health. And the last one, bad health and social support. So you see how this, the population is grouped in different clusters 
and we can say, okay, now we want to deliver a digital health app, right? That has people perform exercise or has a different dialogue. So we can develop different programs for different clusters. And in this way, some people, for example, in cluster six can talk to a coach. People in cluster three that have, are suffering of less physical activity can have an exercise program. So in the future, we can cluster people by risk and assess each group with a different intervention. So this um, we have just now in, in revision our article. If you're interested, it's uploading in bioarchive. We have code that develops both the SHAP analysis and the clustering. Think about all those projects and this can be applied. Pollution, um, drug discovery, it's about grouping um, samples by sharp values, by the informative part of the algorithm. Okay, so we can have questions at the end or after if you want. So as I've said before, for next time, for next pandemic, because it may happen, or for our life in general, there are a lot of suites of um, digital health applications. It would be very nice if we could leverage software like this that stratifies the population and delivers a personalized intervention at low cost. I am using Healthy Minds, just in case. It's a very beautiful um, mindfulness program for free. I doesn't have an, an AI algorithm like this, but I, I, I recommend it. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna switch gears to a different aspect and different type of machine learning algorithms. This is about biomedical image analysis and deep learning. How many of you guys are familiar with deep learning? Is it concept? Okay, it's quite good. So I'm still going to give a little bit in a nutshell of what deep learning means. So this is a mammal neuron, and the neuro neuron receives through the dendrites a lot of inputs. When all these inputs add up, the neuron fires and fires a signal. Now, neurons don't act alone. They are surrounded by other in neurons that receive these inputs, and they are interconnected in the brain as recurrent human neurons. Very beautiful papers out there about recurrent human neural networks that you can read in Nature two years ago. Now, uh, the artificial neuron is inspired in the biological neuron. How? It's an algorithm, it's code that adds different inputs. And when these inputs all add up and are over a particular threshold, there is a yes or a no signal coming out. Now these neurons are interconnected, forming deep neural, artificial neural networks. And interestingly, they work just like the brain networks. How? I'm gonna give you an example about imaging. Imagine that we want to identify whether an object is a car or a face, facial recognition or object recognition. The neural network receives the inputs, processes the inputs very complex, in a very complex way, and then um, yields outputs, right? Our brain does the same. We look at an object, we reason, and then we decide whether which type of object is that. Now, the superficial layers of the neural network recognize lines and edges only. Very basic, just like our eyes and our um, first layers in the brain. As we go deeper and deeper in the neural network, we start to see more complex representations of the object. We can see an ear, a nose, an eye, or the features of the car like the door, the window, and so on. And as we go deeper and deeper, then we start to recognize the objects. It's a car and it's a face. And the outer layers of the net recognize things like roto translations and shades and colors, right? And then we can see that an object is the same. Even if we turn it around, we can still see that. It's the same for the brain and for the neural networks. 
common for people that are more technical. We use the outer layers for dimensionality reduction. And I will show you how in a, in a couple of slides. So I'm going to show you an example of a project that we are now currently working on. And the PhD, uh, this work was done by PhD student Pablo Yanez from Caixa. And the question here, the challenge is, can we understand how we age? That would be great if we can understand how we age. I think it would be holy grail for cosmetic industry, but also for the medical, in, uh, for the medical sector. Are we aging healthily? So can we measure biological age in cells? And can we revert the aging process? Very tempting. So Pablo asked those questions, and we are working in this with a collaboration with Maria Carolina Florian in the Stem Cell and Aging Lab at Velvich and Idibel. Sorry, at Idibel. So the pipeline is the following. We get a confocal microscopy single cell images. This is a cell on a plate and we look at the nuclei of the hematopoietic cell, stem cell. The nucle Our hypothesis is that the nuclei of the cell is very informative. If the cell is old, the chromatin in the nuclei is going to pack in a different way. This is based on a lot of literature, but we want to test it with AI. Can we look at the chromatin of cells, old cells, is it different to the chromatin packing of young cells? Can we have an algorithm that tells us the age of a cell? This is very interesting for drug discovery, and I'll show you how in a minute. So the idea is to predict cells, and this is how the nuclei look under the microscope. They are stained with DAPI. DAPI is a dye that sticks to the DNA. So in the areas that you see a lot of light, there is a lot of chromatin packing. Do you guys see any difference? It's very hard. So if we look at the chromatin packing, or what we call DAP intensity regions, we see some differences. Mainly, we see that young cells tend to be more spherical. They have smaller clusters. And the chromatin tends to be more packed at the surface. But this is very ambiguous, right? Can an AI do better? So Pablo, uh, there's another factor. The microscope gives us 3D images, and they come in uh, slides. So this is very complex. 3D image recognition, 3D image classification uh, with deep learning. So Pablo, um, for the more technical people, we are using um, exception. Um, neural networks, these are convolutional networks. We do a lot of data augmentation, and then we train our, our neural network based on the single images. So the neural network receives each image, and it assigns a probability of being young, young or being old. And then we collate, and we group all this probability, and we average, we do a voting. And then we have the probability of the cell being aged or young or old. And it's very interesting because our performance was really high, was about 83% of accuracy. This is something we cannot do by AI. And now we are using explainable AI to try to understand what makes a cell young or what makes a cell being old. And these are results from a few weeks ago. So I, don't, I owe you for the next time the explainability results because we are really working on it. We want to understand which pixels in the image are informative of being young and being old. So stay tuned. I hope in a few months being able to express, to explain that. But I just want to share with you um, how we will use this in the future. Suppose that we put drugs on plates where we have stem cells. And then we have all in our plates, we put very old stem cells. And then we put compounds that we hope will revert the age. If our machine learning algorithm will say, okay, old, 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 and somebody, and at some point says young, it means that in that way, we have a, a compound that is able to revert aging. That's how we plan to use uh, these um, algorithms. 
So stay tuned. I, ha I hope to have more news very in a couple of months. So now I'm going to show you on my last pro one of the last projects I want to show today, and uh, it's about medical application. This is a beautiful project uh, working with Hassan Sial and the company Criba. I'll explain more a bit about them in a, in a second, about meningitis. Meningitis is an excruciating condition. It's an inflammation of the brain due to infection that can be bacteria or viral. It affects babies, and it's a question of time. If a baby has meningitis, it can be minutes when they die. Usually it takes a bit longer, but it's very important that we detect meningitis very early by looking at the white blood cells in the brain. How is this typically done? It's, an, um, it's a very it's a, what they call lumbar puncture. They put an in injection in your spine. And as a mom, I can say, like, I would rather not have my kid had such an invasive uh, you know, process, right? I mean, if it's really important, you see that baby has a lot of symptoms, it's fine. But if the baby is there and they, they don't have a lot of symptoms, I would say, no, don't do that. But then it's a question of time. I may be at home and the baby is in very, very bad shape. So most people affected by this and in, in Sub-Sahara, there's a lot of people in poor Africa, uh, poor parts of Africa affected by this condition. So can we use AI to have a less invasive, more precise uh, diagnostic method? So now the company NBA, Newborn Solutions, now it's Criba, they changed the name. They have a way of using ultrasound to count the white blood cells in the in, in fluids. So this is a very small machine, it's like that, it's portable, and it's an ultrasound machine. So they can use this uh, probe to measure the baby's fontanelle. The baby's fontanelle is this part of the brain where the meningitis, uh, where you measure whether there will be white blood cells or not. So. The idea is to use the ultrasound to measure the fontanelle of the baby and see and evaluate whether the babies have meningitis or not by counting the white blood cells. So the first images that come from the ultrasound have this shape. How many of you think that white blood cells are shown more in the, one, in the, in the first column? Meningitis here? How many? No? How many meningitis here? It's, it's kind of impossible. I've shown this in, in medical congresses of radiologists and they, they just don't know. But amazingly, the AI can tell. Um, so Hassan has implemented a ResNet 50 pre-trained on ImageNet. This is, ImageNet is a very large uh, data set of images of cars, faces, and so on. You pre-train your models, and then you apply it. We have several frames from each patient, and then for each frame we have a probability. We use soft voting to average the probability, and then we get a precision and recall of about 90%. At the beginning, I used to choose AI projects where you can tell by eye the difference. I never thought that and AI could do something like this. This has changed my, my way of thinking. So you can see a very clear separation between the, those images that have meningitis and the images that are of healthy patients. So this is when it becomes really important that we are use explainable AI to understand what is in the model. Is this a bias? Is this real? Can we learn more about meningitis using explainable AI? So now I have results for this. We know that the first column is of kids and babies that have meningitis. And you can see in the column the white blood cell count. The first image has 85. It has a concentration of 85. And the last image has over 2,000 cells per microliter. So this is packed with blood cells, with white blood cells. This huge infection here, and you just can't see it. 
And here, there is very little, but there is a lot of clutter. Here, there is an artifact in the ultrasound. How can the AI tell them apart? I'm sorry to tell you that uh, well, before that, I, let me use to explain a bit about what methods we're using. So here, this algorithm is called LIME. And this algorithm, or there are a couple of AI algorithms for imaging. This one, we can use LIME or we can use GRADCAM. So GRADCAM looks at the gradient in the image and it's able to tell us which pixels in the image are informative of being a dog or being a cat. So for example, for dog, it looks at the face, at the eyes and the mouth. And for eyes, sometimes it looks at the ears. So we use algorithms like this to explain which pixels in the image are most informative. So we're gonna use the same algorithm in our meningitis versus healthy images. And when we apply them, we look like this. So meningitis images look like huge blobs, whereas we don't see those blobs in the images that don't have meningitis. So now we understand that the deep learning algorithm is recognizing something that we can't see. Are these blobs the cells? No, they are not. A cell in this resolution is like three pixels. So this is the aurea of a cell. This is the packing of a cell. This is the cell and the environment. But for sure, there is something in the gradient of the image that is not visible by eye, but can be caught by the deep learning algorithm. This is at the gradient level. And of course, if we see one or two cells in the healthy, but that's fine. It's under the, um, under the threshold of the disease, which is 30. So if you have more than 30 cells, then you have meningitis. But if you have less, you have one or two, that's not, that's not a condition. So what we learned from this is that deep learning can sometimes detect imaging patterns that we cannot see by eye. And that for me was game changing. How and in which many applications can we use deep learning that for things that we cannot resolve by eye? So Kriva has three other different applications and we are working with them in two other projects. We are detecting white blood cells in dialysis patients in the backs from, a, from kidney disease. And we are also looking at uveitis where you have white blood cells in your eyes. So the device is so small that you can put it in your eye and uh, measure the amount of uh, white blood cells for uveitis. And we are working with them in these two projects. I think for me, it's very interesting because we can, as an academic lab, contribute to a company. We work together in the project, and then this gets being deployed uh, directly in the clinic. And the other nice experience is that we need to go to the lab as data scientists to actually measure with them and to understand this about the pixels of the cells and the clutter and the noise of the artifact. As data scientists, we just cannot stay in our desk. We really have to go and measure together with them to understand the technology. So I think maybe to wrap up uh, this part of the talk is what is essential is often invisible to the eyes, but maybe AI can teach us to see better. And what is the implication of this line in medicine? Because I show this to the doctors and they say, well, but we are still the doctors, right? Are, is the AI going to be better than a doctor? It's not going to be better. It's going to help the doctor to see what they cannot see. They cannot see because the pattern is not resolved. They cannot be resolved by eye or because they just don't have the time. They look at things in five minutes. They look at our reports in five minutes. I have 10 more minutes to wrap up. Um, five more minutes. So I'm going to give it. I'm going to change the topic to the future. How this moves to the next years next year because everything goes so fast. So for now, I'm showing here a couple of projects, a few projects that we have in the lab that I haven't mentioned today. Uh, malaria, sepsis, cancer, uh, newborn baby survival, but all these applications are what we call narrow AI. 
I don't know if you guys are familiar with this term. We usually talk about AI. AI can do this, AI can do that. But so far, the AI that we have at our hands today is narrow AI. It can perform one task at a time. It's very specific. It needs training, it needs testing, and so on. Can we expand beyond narrow AI? Is there will be an application for general AI? So if, you, if I had to answer this question two years ago, I would say, no, this will have narrow AI for a long time, but things are changing so fast. In the last couple of years, we have seen a change in paradigm. This change in paradigm is called foundation models. So you probably heard about ChatGPT, right? Everybody heard about ChatGPT. But now if you compare ChatGPT3 with ChatGPT4, we see that ChatGPT4 is able to take into account other data modalities. Foundation models are very specific types of algorithms that they can take everything. We can, we can train them and, and use them to analyze all kinds of data text, images, speech, remote sensing, video. And then what is interesting about, and particularly about them, is that they are not specific anymore. They can be trained for one task, for translation, and then they help us understand a text they never seen before. If you use ChatGPT, you have also wondered how many different uses you can give to these models. Can it do that? Oh my God, it can do that, right? It can summarize a text, give you ideas for a new proposal. It can give you questions for an interview. It can give you answers for any interviews. It can write a cover letter. It can write a Tinder profile. <laughs> so how can... What? I can generate a picture. I can generate a picture. Thank you for that. So let's... Stick to biomedicine. How can we use um, this chat GPT and this foundation model in medicine? A lot of medical apps have now their own health um, chatbots. It's the doctor. They ask for symptoms. They tell you what you have and so on. Doctors are using this actively in decision support when they have to um, give a recommendation or make a diagnosis for a specific drug. They're using this for writing reports for clinical documentation, and interestingly, us as patients, we are using this for asking medical questions to judge GPT, which we may not ask a doctor. This starts to become more relevant for very um, sensitive topics like mental health, sexual health. We rather would use the AI than ask a professional. So what I say about this is that ethically, in the future, these AI doctors will become much more precise and even empathic, right? But as consumers, we will always have the right to know whether we are talking to an AI or whether we are talking to a human. And we need to, as consumer and as society, talk about that and ask for that. We need that regulation. So imagine. And with this, I want to finish with a very positive tone. Imagine the hospital of the future. We will go to the doctor, and the doctor will not be typing. The doctor will be looking at us and asking us questions, because this will be typed automatically. The doctor will have time to be more empathic and to be more thorough with the questions they ask, because we are systems. We are not organs, right? So then. Everything will be typed, will be uploaded, and then we will be able, the doctor will be able automatically to have more information about our health as compared to many, many other people about comparing our, our problems with population data. Are we outliers? Which are the patterns in the, our data that are early informative of symptoms? And once we have those answers, we will have that the doctor will have automated diagnosis support, treatment recommendations, clinical reports will be written automatically. And then we will have this home monitoring. And the data from home monitoring will come back 
to us as patients. And then the cycle starts and gets better and better. So this looks amazing, right? But the, so far, we're very far. We're very far in a few aspects. This technology is great. It's even a bit scary. There are four things that need to be of concern, that are of concern about these new foundation models. The first one, I've mentioned it before, they have what is called emergent capabilities. They have been trained for something and they are becoming very good at something else. How that is going to be safe in the medical aspect. The second, and you may be familiar with this, they hallucinate. We need to check them. Checking and give, providing references for this type of models is a huge area of, of work at the moment. Then there is the lack of model transparency and interpretability. I mentioned SHAP and LIME, but SHAP and LIME has not been developed yet for foundation models, another hot area of research. And last, they have biases. And here I show you an interesting bias that I tried a couple of weeks ago where I asked ChatGPT, the nurse married the doctor because she was pregnant. Who was pregnant? And ChatGPT answers, in the sentence, the nurse married the doctor because she was pregnant, the pronoun she refers to the nurse. The nurse was pregnant. And I go, what about the doctor being pregnant? And she, ChatGPT says, the doctor cannot be pregnant because she doesn't have a female sexual reproductive system. I go like, can doctors be female? And then she answers, oh, I'm sorry, this is a bias in the algorithm. Can them be both female? Mm. Oh yes, they can also be both female. Mm. So you can try this yourself so with doctor, with the boss, with the president. It was at least a few months ago, this was the case. So these types of biases are embedded in our technology every day. We can't even see them and we need to be aware of them. So last, I'm going to mention one project that we are working and we are very excited. Now, yes, yeah, one minute, one minute. Yeah, it's, it's a roundup. How can we take this to our lab? And we want to use these language models, language vision models now. And we are thinking, how can we improve the medical practice? So a project that has me really, really excited is a collaboration with Sampao where we are thinking about using multi-scene. This is a 3D time series video analysis. Let me see if I can play it. Okay, there. Uh, with the cardiology unit, where we look at problems in the heart and where we are comparing normal with cardiopathy. And our dream is to incorporate this type of, uh, this type of sequences, this type of video sequences together with the doctor's report and train an AI model, which I call CMR, um, GPT, MR stands for magnetic resonance, cardiological magnetic resonance, to automate the writing of medical reports. So in the future, we hope to have a system that writes the report automatically. And if you are, there is a resident doctor, for example, that doesn't have a lot of experience, he or she can learn from the automated system, as long as, as also as saving a lot of time. And with that, uh, I wanted to uh, share with you the fact that we are going to have our Women in Data Science Barcelona Biomedicine. This is an event in October, open for everybody. Uh, we are trying to visibilize women that data scientists, but everybody's invited and we will have a poster session for everybody. Maybe you guys were uh, here uh, last year. And I want to thank you for your attention and also um, thank all our collaborators and our team uh, for their help. So thank you for your attention. And thank you very much, Paula. This was uh, terrific insightful. I foresee several questions in the room. We have a couple of minutes for them. If there's questions online, there's also going to be questions. So thank you so much. I have I think you know, another narrow AI question. <laughs> so um, for me, what was like a bit striking, and I think that it's really interesting, is the fact that 
you can, where you're trying to predict the aging of a cell with that, I think it's a microscope, this is or what, like this. A focal microscope, yeah. Yeah, so my question is because I'm working more on the omics part. <laughs> so how, so do you also have data, like omics data for yes. that mice and how does it relate to that? So, so are you planning to yes, check? Yes, absolutely. So we're planning to use uh, different imaging channels and the last part of Pablo's uh, thesis is to integrate omics data, young versus old. So that can be integrated as one more channel or as a different classifier. So for people, I don't know how much technical is the question, but you can have two classifiers and then have an ensemble model that votes from two. This is young, this is old, okay. And then you can average the probability that comes from the omics and also from the images. But I think for me, it would be much more interesting to have one model that integrates the image and the omics, because then you can use cross explainability to say what features in the image correlate with the omics. The only problem with using the omics is that we don't have omics at single cell level. So here we have one cell, one label, but the omics will come from a cluster of cells. Gene expression will come from, for example, <coughs> from one cluster of cells. So that's our limitation. So I think for the moment, we will have to use them separate. But for sure, omics is another deep learning candidate here. Absolutely. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask about the meningitic results because I mean, we've also been there. Lyme doesn't, I mean, our interpretation was Lyme is not working <laughs> because we can, I mean, is this a possibility? Is this a possibility that, that it's just that they just don't get what the, yes. what the model is? And how can we get at that? I really like this question because when you show these talks, you only show the things that work. And then the questions, you have the opportunity to show. So with explainability, uh, in the Spanish sense, we damos caña. Because we try all of them. Lime didn't work. Gradcam worked. It worked to show some blobs. It worked to show something versus nothing. But we really don't understand what's in those blobs. So now what we are looking is at different metrics like entropy. And we know that the amount of blobs are the amount of important pixels correlate with the amount of cells. So then you can use tricks to explain the explainability. So if you are using Lime and it doesn't work, after a while, try another one. There are like five more. Mm. But it's, I think the other, and then I can also share with you some other things that work for us. We are using the last convolutional layer uh, in a UMAP to show different distributions, but that's a bit more technical and we can discuss it later. As I said before, remember the, the deep neural network where you have each layer. You can get the <clears throat> you can get the data from the last layer. It has lower dimensionality, and you try to understand from there what is the network seeing. Then we can discuss offline. And I'm welcome if anyone wants to write to me or like uh, so we can discuss more technically. I just have a simple question about the aging, the cell aging study. Um, so you said you summed across the layers of the confocal microscope. Did you look at like each layer? Because you can imagine if the outer layers is where the cells are, the younger cells potentially does have a much higher probability of predictive power. The last, the last layers don't have anything because they are very small. Okay. Because it's like a, it's like a circle. Yeah. So we only mostly use the middle ones. Okay. But we have two different models. We have one model with slides that then you yeah. average the probability, and now we're developing a 3D model. Okay. And this is a 3D deep, uh, neural network. It's given better results and okay. more interpretable. But I don't have the last Please. the last part yeah. ready. We are there. <laughs> and I, I don't like to show something that then you can, you can retract. Yeah. But I think the most novel aspect is a 3D neural network. Yeah. In microscopy, we, we, there are not many papers on that. Uh, in the first project where you showed the explainability, what kind of uh, model did you use to get these features that you used to generate? Yes. So then, this is a good idea to talk about SHAP and the machine learning models. Uh, SHAP doesn't work with all the machine learning models. So when you're working with machine learning models, 
you want to choose one that also works with SAP. In this case, because then you want to explain. So at least I think this is very relevant to explain. So for example, in this case, it was XGBoost. Most deep neural network or most neural network algorithms, XGBoost, or tree-like, Adaboost, they work well with SHAP. But before you implement, just make sure that your algorithm, uh, before you, you finish your project, that your algorithm can be explained. Because I think every time, this will become more and more important. I hope that answers the, the question. It is XGBoost. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more question? Day two, okay. Uh, I think that was the first yeah, question. Yeah, I have one. I mean, mine is more philosophical. I'm not working mm -hmm. that with uh, machine learning, but I mean, this looks like magic. And I always, how is this going to impact? So what can we do as a researchers to be sure that this not, does not impact the way that, I don't know, we can get a private insurance or that this is only available for private companies and people with low incomes cannot take advantage of these AI, well, doctors that know how to work with this AI to not create inequalities among the patients. This is the question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we know already that AI is already associated with a lot of inequalities from gender. Also, think about the data that we use comes from digitalized countries. For training the meningitis algorithm, we use data from Spanish hospital. But now we're testing it, this is amazing, we're testing it in uh, Africa, and it doesn't generalize that well. And I didn't show that data, obviously, because we're working on it. People have a lot of hair. And they may have to cut the hair, which is invasive. So in every country, like the generalization of AI, to make it equitable for everybody, is like, I think, the main topic that we should be paying attention. So I don't have a, an answer to this. There is, I would say that when I develop methodology for a paper, you use a validation, you use train and test. But the main and most important thing for any medical paper is that you're trained test and validation in an external court. I really value much more the articles and the works that have external validation. Same for digital health apps. They are showing papers that the 50 people. Our paper is on 40 people. But that's what we can do. But now I'm, I'm worried about this, and I think a lot about this. But now my main worry is how do we get AI in the hospital in the first place? Because there are so many papers, and there is no AI in the hospital. I go and say this, and people don't like it. But there is no AI in the hospital. You talk to the hospital clinic, and there is no AI there. A lot of research, but there is no AI. The problem is interoperability. How you get these algorithms in the subsystem? It's so basic, but uh, yeah. So <laughs> once we have them in the hospital, I think the next worry is to make sure it's democratized for everybody. Final question. Okay. So my name is Miguel Angel. Uh, it's a little bit fast. So you have said that uh, you are using XGBoost, so XGBoost field three decision trees. And also, you were using SHAP for making more understandable the decision that is using Exibus. So, another way of using Exibus, and yes, we can say understand what it's doing is to take a look on the trees and to the trees. So, you can see how um, the dependency of the features also and how the model is making the decision of being yes. depressed or not depressed. So, are you taking are you following that path also for checking the dependency between the features? I'm not looking at the tree. I'm okay. looking at the feature importance and okay. the local feature. In this paper, we're looking at the local feature importance. Okay. How, why the model, how the model diagnoses depression or anxiety. What is different between depression and anxiety? And you will see that there are other features. And finally, we look at why this person is depressed. So it's two, global and local. But we're not looking at the tree decision. I, it may be interesting, hmm. but no, we don't use it in this case. Okay. I mean, maybe it's uh, nice to see that because as everything is pushing and it's moving to a personalized medicine, maybe it's nice to see how the dependency of this feature are working. Because if someone are presenting two or three or four things that 
increase so much the chances maybe it's nice so ah okay i understand what you ask the dependency yes, like two three features. features so shop yes shop and also in the paper has an additional feature that they haven't mentioned it looks at two or three features at the same time so here we see and we show that young people that couldn't exercise as much were at risk not for older people it's like younger people and exercise were connected versus people that were older an interconnection of features this is a very nice sharp feature that you look at importance of two variables and their correlation and then if you look at the manual of sharp you can also i don't know if you have ever done that but it's very interesting uh, there is a, but but it, this is a very nice feature looking at two variables the information provided by two variables or three variables at the same time so time is up. Uh, thank you very much, thank you. everyone. Thank you, Paula, for being this amazing talk. Feel free to write to me if you have questions or anything that you want. Yeah, I'm around.